thank you for tuning in for this edition of Justice Watch with Attorney Zulu Ali. I am Attorney Zulu Ali with the Justice Watch crew, Rosa Nunez, Michael Clark, and Dr. Akil Bashir. This week, like we do every week, we'll be talking about critical and important legal issues affecting our communities. Our topic today is a call to action, religious institutions, and their impact on criminal justice. Our uh, guest today uh, is Imam Ron El Amin and Pastor Frank Hernandez. Imam Ron El Amin has been a member of the Muslim American community, asso community associated with the leadership of Imam Worth Dean Muhammad since 1975. In 1980, he was elected the resident Imam of Muhammad's Mosque in Riverside, California. In 1987, he traveled to Saudi Arabia where he studied Quranic Arabic at the Institute of Arabic Language at Imam Muhammad Abin Saud University in the capital city of Riyadh. While in Arabia, he performed the Hajj, Islamic Holy Pilgrimage in Mecca, and later visited many of the religious and historical sites in the sacred city of Medina as well as other areas. In 1991, upon his return to the United States, Imam El Amin served as the first Muslim chaplain hired by the State of California Department of Mental Health. In 1999, Imam El Amin was part of a delegation headed by Imam Worth Dean Muhammad, who was invited by the uh, Focolar community uh, and the Vatican to visit Rome, Italy. There he participated in a three-day interfaith world conference, Muslim Friends of the Focolar, and was able to, t to tour religious, cultural, and histor historical sites of Rome and Florence. The delegation was later invited to the Vatican where Imam Worth Dean Muhammad met Pope John Paul II and in his presence spoke to an audience of over 100,000 people. In 2002, he received the Ambassador for Peace Award from the Interreligious and International Federation for World Peace for his work in bridge building among diverse religious communities and cultures. In 2005, Imam El Amin headed a delegation of 10 to Japan, the first of series of goodwill tours designed to introduce Muslims of African American descent to world cultures and also to share their experiences and with the world. In 2007, he served as president of the Muslim American Chaplains Association and currently serves as convener of the American Muslim Community Endorsement Agency. In 2011, he was selected to serve as a permanent member of SACIR, the State Advisory Committee for Institutional Religion, designed to advise the governor on religious affairs with regards to state institutions and the local community. He continues to serve in that capacity today. And Pastor Frank Hernandez was born and raised in Corona, California, and is married with four children and seven grandchildren. At the age of 12, he joined a gang. Shortly thereafter, he got arrested and continued to live his teenage life in and out of juvenile hall. He ended up spending all of his high school years in juvenile hall, boys' homes, and Twin Pines, a juvenile detention center in uh, San Jacinto Mountains. At 17 and a half, he was arrested. He was released from juvie, uh, and he met his wife of 30 years and ended up going to prison in 2004. Halfway through his term, he encountered the Lord through a prison ministry that came to the prison. Uh, when he was released, he kept his focus on serving the Lord. He got a job in 2007 uh, working as a drafter where he became a manager of an engineering department, and currently he's a safety and fleet manager for the same company, uh, and he was able to accomplish that uh, with, with no formal education. And in 2010, he and his wife were ordained as ministers at a church uh, in uh, Riverside called Good News Church. Then in 2005, they were commissioned and sent to start their uh, current church, Kingdom Living, also here in Riverside. And it targets those in gangs and drugs in our communities, as well as any, uh, anywhere we can, they can be effective. Last year, he went to Africa and will be going back in July for missions. Uh, he's also uh, starting to complete his first book, uh, and he's looking to be uh, released at the end of this year. So for both of our guests, I want to thank each of you for, for joining us today. One of the things I want to begin by is talking about, um, you know, one of the things that is kind of like a common uh, denominator, at least from my perspective, as well as uh, my staff here, you know, uh, uh, Bilal, who actually spends a lot of time dealing with the youth, as well as Dr. Akil Bashir, who actually spends a lot of time in the street dealing with, with people 
that, you know, they got their, their pulse to the street. And myself, you know, practicing and representing individuals who are who both inside of the, the institutions as well as those who are facing incarceration. It's a common theme uh, from our perspective, and we've talked about this, you know, over the last month or so, and actually over the last few years, to be quite honest with you, about the, significant, uh, the significance of faith and how much that plays such an important role in all aspects of the criminal justice system, both being from the perspective of deterring crime as well as uh, when someone is actually incarcerated, actually providing that faith that will actually, as far as the programs, I think there's no question that in, in these correctional institutions that the religious programs are actually the most effective programs mm -hmm. without any question. Uh, and tend to get quite a bit of support most of the time. However, we do know that there's also issues. And when we're talking about reentering into society, the importance that uh, that faith based if that that people have when they come out, putting people, giving you that moral barometer and giving you that that for whatever, regardless of whatever religion you're speaking of, when you have individuals who are able to begin to start getting in touch with their faith and, and, and worshiping their creator. We just, I believe that the recidivism rate is, is, is extremely high, you know, keeping individuals from, you know, going back because the recidivism rate is so high in the United States. I mean, I, I think it's like 60%. They say that basically within the first few years of being released from prison, probably 60 to 65% of the individuals that are released go back. I mean, and it depends on what numbers you're looking at. However, I think that when you begin to start looking at individuals who get out and begin to start doing things from a pro positive perspective, then I think those who ate, who basically embrace, you know, some sort of faith-based program, regardless of what it, what it is, and, and obviously the most known, obviously, is the Christian faith and the Islamic faith, Judaism, whatever it may be, when they begin to start embracing their uh, uh, you know, their creator, then it seems like that's how we begin to start seeing positive things go on in an individual's life. I mean, it gives you that that moral compass, I, I guess, for the lack of a better word, of how we're going to, how they're going to live their life. Um, and, you know, the United States, obviously, I was looking at a, at a statistics, it said that the United States has 5% of the world's population but 25% of the world's incarcerated population. Mm -hmm. I mean, and that's, that's, that's very mm -hmm. alarming, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, and when we, we can talk about doing all kinds of things to assist individuals from trying to, first of all, getting themselves into situations where they're dealing with uh, the criminal justice system or going on the wrong path, or as well as what's happening as far as corrections is concerned, or whatever, is going to happen with an individual is getting out and preventing that individual to come back. But based upon my conversations with individuals, based upon my beliefs, there's no question that when that individual begins to start getting in touch with um, their creator, then I always, I, be, I definitely believe that it, it provides them with the foundation that they need to become a productive member of society. And we don't see our institutions enough going outside of the walls of their institutions and reaching out and trying to touch individuals in the street and providing programs. I mean, it's almost, you know, we're, they're preaching to the choir. Mm -hmm. But when you begin to start going out into the streets and you begin to start touching individuals, I know when you, when you think, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back, and, and, and it's a controversial issue, but I'm going to talk on it because I think it's really, really important. Um, the, uh, during the na days of the Nation of Islam, where you had a significant number of individuals who basically, and when I say the days, I'm talking about the older days during the time of, of El Hajj Malik Shabazz and those earlier days when you had individuals. And even after that, when you talk about Imam Worth Dean Muhammad, when you talk, people don't understand how many of those individuals had criminal records. And even though that they had that criminal record, giving them that structure and that foundation allowed many of those individuals to come out and lead a productive life from the perspective that they're not out there committing any criminal acts. Mm -hmm. And the same thing happens for the Christian faith, for those who go in and actually 
you know, some oftentimes you do have individuals that as younger individuals are baptized and they go through the church, but it's a formality. Mm-hmm. But then when they go in and they, they really touch and they really understand it, uh, then it's the same thing. They go out there, and I know you're a testament to that, uh, uh, Pastor Frank, by someone who actually had the experience of actually being incarcerated, going on the wrong path, you know, embracing your creator, and and it uh, ended up being something obviously positive, so much so that you're able to go back in the community and you're helping other individuals not pursue that same path, or if they pursue that same path, not going back. Correct. Yeah. So I, I kind of want to get your impact a little bit about how you feel as far as what you're doing right now as far as trying to touch individuals on the street and making sure that individuals who are keeping them, first of all, not getting into the system. But if they do get into the system, how do you help them and how do you help make sure that they don't go back? Well, first off, um, thank you for this opportunity mm-hmm. to be here. Mm-hmm. But, um, yeah, I think that it's it's so important to help those who – who are in that place of gangs and drugs and, you know, uh, do, do committing crime, understand that, that there is someone who loves them, uh, you know, besides their mom and dad. And of course we, we, we know all those things, but there is our, our, our God is, is, is who loves them so much so that, you know, he's, he, you know, in our, in the Christian faith, he sent his son to die for them. And, and we have to help them understand that. See, I have I have a little saying that says everyone knows what's wrong with them, but not too many people know what's right with them. And when we help them understand what's right with them, well then 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 they can start understanding that the, that the that the call in their life is bigger than themselves. Mm-hmm. That there that there is something greater. That there is something bigger than 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 them, and it helps them and it kind of sets the course. The 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 scriptures say that uh, um, without vision, the people perish. And it's helping them understand that there's a vision for their life, that they have purpose, they have destiny. And when they understand that, now they're more inclined to make right decisions versus making the wrong decisions. Mm-hmm. You know, I deal with, 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 with people who've been involved in gangs and drugs um, all the time. And, and it's instilling that, that, that understanding into them. You know, of course, I'm going to be receptive. Of course, I'm going to be not receptive. Mm-hmm. But when they become receptive to it, you know, they, you, 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 you begin to see the changes in their life and how they, instead of acting out how they used to act out, they begin to act out differently, mm-hmm. you know, because now they have a change. Of, they have a, they, their mind begins to change and they begin to be receptive to, to scripture. They begin to be receptive to an understanding that I don't have to act this way no more. You know, there, there's something bigger than me and there's, there's a call in my life. And I think when they understand that it makes a big difference. And uh, Imam Ron El Amin, how do you, <clears throat> from your perspective, how do you see the uh, our community reaching out, and and how important is it? Well, I think it's it's we we must reach out, and it is of the utmost importance. Um, you know, I started out as a young man, 23 years old, and I joined the Nation of Islam. Mm-hmm. And I was a foot soldier. Mm. And you read some things on my bio that I'm doing now. Nice. <clears throat> uh, I'm back and forth into Sacramento, sitting at the table with folks. Mm. Uh, but whatever I am <clears throat> and whatever people say I am, mm. that will never negate the fact that we have to roll up our sleeves and we have to be willing to bring someone into our, <clears throat> our embrace mm-hmm. and let them walk with us mm-hmm. and, and mentor them and let them feel our love mm-hmm. and know that we are concerned about them. Mm-hmm. Uh, before I came here today, um, I stopped and was dealing, stopped to talk to a young man that I've been working with. He comes from a pretty horrific life. He was pretty, pretty rough background. Mm -hmm. And he's decided that he wants to be a Muslim now. Mm -hmm. So that's not going to be easy. One of the hardest things for young brothers and sisters is to pull the pants up. Mm -hmm. That's not the most important thing. That takes time. Mm -hmm. But we need to understand 
how difficult that is when the, the, the whole identity, everything is, is connected to that. Uh, and so I think we as leaders, we have to be willing to do that. Someone uh, took me into their embrace. Mm -hmm. I had several mentors and they walked with me to let me be with them. Mm -hmm. And they taught me many things. And some of those people had, I have washed and shrouded their bodies and placed them in their graves. Mm -hmm. But were it not for them having that kind of concern and showing me that kind of love, I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you right. at this table today. Right. Right. I, think that's, I think that's where it begins. Right. Of course, it's, it, it's, it's much broader than that. Mm -hmm. But I think that's the root where the foundation lies, right. mm -hmm. to have that, that, that heart and that mindset for mm -hmm. that. Right. Yeah, I know speaking with both of you, I mean, it's just so, you know, um, realizing, you know, at least from my perspective, that, you know, these individuals that for whatever reason are, you know, I'm always the one that always believes that, you know, my creator's testing me, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And, and as an attorney, you know, I always tell people that, you know, the most valuable person is a witness. Mm -hmm. Right. A witness that didn't see anything don't mean anything. Right. That's right. <laughs> and so, you know, when you have somebody, you know, I always say that it's the same thing That's as it. life. You know, when you have someone who goes through certain things in life like yourself, Pastor Frank, and the things that like you did, you know, your mom, Ron, you know, you, you can tell you, you have a testimony. Yes. You know, that you can give to people. And I think that God, there's no accidents. And he puts us through these these tests and these trials and then you can tell someone about your story and then you know you can help somebody mm -hmm. you know what I mean mm -hmm. and I'm always amazed you know um, how you know a person can come from the situation like you know like Bilal who was had a life sentence basically yeah and he's reformed and through his faith he's reformed himself and now he's actually mentoring other people and now people can look at him and they can say, I can come from this to there because we're all, everybody's struggling with something. That's yes. what you always hear. You know, everybody's got a problem. Everybody's struggling. I'm dealing with this. I'm dealing with that. But, you know, the great part about faith is that, you know, you know, our, our creator doesn't make any state, mistakes. Mm -hmm. He is the one, nothing happens unless he, he lets it happen. Right. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, that's why a lot of times when you find people who embrace faith, who are very reluctant to go outside the doors for whatever political reasons, or they don't want to say certain things, and they're scared of speaking out, then I'm always like, you know, you know, I'm not scared of nobody except my creator. Mm -hmm. You know, I believe my faith is more stronger. You can't do anything to me unless my creator allows you to do it to me. Mm -hmm. and, and a lot of times people are so scared to speak out for these things that are going on, like the police brutality, you know. Um, now, if you got police brutality going on or you have issues going on, your faith should allow you to be able to go out in the streets and speak up for that and not be scared of your position or your role mm -hmm. in society. You know, if, if one of the, if somebody that my creator, his, you know, his creations, uh, I'm going to speak up about it. If I'm going to see wrong, my faith allows me to do that. You know what I mean? I think I'm being tested. I think that when I see something wrong, that my creator is testing me. When I speak out on it, I feel like that's an obligation, not for me, for me necessarily, because, you know, obviously we do get scared, mm -hmm. but I'm more scared of my creator than I'm scared of, sure. of, of someone else, you know? So I think that's what happens a lot of times when you have individuals who are actually involved, who are in our faith-based community, they're fearful of going out and speaking out in a way that sometimes scared them. I mean, like some of them, they they belong to like there's an hierarchy in certain religious mm -hmm. organizations. Sure. And you say, hey, man, can you know, can you come and help me go out here? I want to talk about the situation that's happening to this individual in the street, or I, I want to start some sort of program. They say, well, you know, let me go up and talk to, you know, the you know somebody <laughs> in the hierarchy of the of the of the church or wherever wherever, mm -hmm. and they come back and say, you know, I don't think they want me to speak on that. Yeah, right now, that's you know, and that's that's kind of troubling to me. Yeah, I, I think that, you know, when you get that burden, when you get that, you, you know, it's kind of a like like a woman when she's pregnant, you know, she starts to get the 
the, the shell starts from the baby kick, mm-hmm. you know, and, and, and there's and there's signals when it's time to go into labor. There's there's indicators, there's flags that a woman knows, hey, it's it's time, mm-hmm. and it's almost like that what you're talking about when someone gets that 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 kicking that that nudge to do something, you know, and and, and religion does that. You're absolutely correct. They they hey, well, let me go talk to you know my my pastor, make sure this is okay. I tell my people, no. If you if you if you're feeling a call to go do something, mm-hmm. we're gonna stand behind you. We're, we want to see God fulfill the call in your life, mm-hmm. because it's not just about the pastor. It's not just about the the leader. It's this this is this is a, a, a when God created the earth, He He wanted He said that in 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 Genesis, He says it's not good that man should be alone. Mm-hmm. He meant for us to be in community. He meant for us to to be surrounded. And, and and do things together mm-hmm. it, it's it's better when we do things together you know when we do it by ourselves you know we we lose sight we get misguided we 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 get sidetracked but when we have those around us that are doing something together mm-hmm. we can accomplish more together than we can by ourselves right absolutely and 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 when so you know when somebody says hey hey pastor i, I want i want to go on the street and i want to go talk to you know this gang or this these guys instead of guys hang out in the corner mm-hmm. let's go right. let let's go let's go let's go talk to them mm-hmm. You know, absolutely. and and that and that's right. That 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 that's absolutely correct. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of times I think in 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 the religious mindsets, you know, we have all these hierarchies of. Sometimes it's good, but it also diminishes those mm-hmm. who are getting the urge to do something that they feel God's calling them to do, right. and we end up shutting them down, and they lose. They they get they get discouraged. They feel like, oh well, you know what? Then just forget it. You know, maybe I'm not of no value to go do something like that. And they lose, and they lose sight of, of who God created them to be, and, and their gifting of the possibility of what could have happened if they would have went. Mm-hmm. That's absolutely, that's absolutely right. Yeah, I think also that the, uh, I'm encouraged with the position that, well, he's not that new anymore. The Pope has taken with regards to uh, his parishioners mm-hmm. that, you know, he, he, he's saying, look, we, we we've gotten too comfortable. And we need to go come out from behind these walls and go out into the society, mm-hmm. out into the alleys, the parkways, the walkways, et cetera, and embrace the people. Mm-hmm. Uh, this, in, in, in my opinion, or in my estimation, is, is the work of Christ Jesus. Mm-hmm. It's the work of Muhammad the prophet who said that if you see a wrong, you should first try to change it with your hands. Mm-hmm. And if you can't change it with your hands, you should, you should speak out against it. Mm-hmm. And if you can't speak out against it, if you don't speak out against it, then you, you should at least hate it mm-hmm. in, your, in your heart. So I think what has happened, I think the church, when I say the church, I'm talking about myself, mm-hmm. okay? I'm the only Muslim in my, <laughs> in my family. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so when I go to the church, I'm, I'm comfortable. Mm-hmm. You know, I was going to talk to you about visiting your church. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think... The church uh, has failed in this sense, and even the mosque, because the mosque, we're like the new kids on the block. Mm-hmm. We haven't been too long here in this country, uh, comparatively speaking. Mm-hmm. But I think the religious leadership has kind of set back and allowed uh, corporate America and also Hollywood to define our lives mm-hmm. for us, mm-hmm. to define our cultural life, to tell us what we should eat, with whom we should associate, mm-hmm. what we should wear, and all of these things. Mm-hmm. And that has always been the traditional role of the church. Mm-hmm. That's, that's the role of the mosque. I mean, the mosque is, it was, has always served as the, as the center, the hub of the community with regards to the life in the traditions of Muhammad the prophet. Mm-hmm. But now we don't, we, don't, we don't see that happening, I think, mainly because of politics mm-hmm. and money right. mm-hmm. has distracted us from the work of Christ and the mm-hmm. work of Muhammad. Absolutely, mm-hmm. absolutely. Mm-hmm. And, and it's also, you know, uh, has came to building uh, that bridge between, you know, the... Uh, you know, Muslims and the Christians. Mm-hmm. You know what mm-hmm. I mean. I know one time I was actually when I was in Nashville, I was asked to give a a, a talk about religion. They asked the rabbi, they had a Christian minister, and the teacher um, 
I worked with her husband as a police officer, and he asked me to come and speak on this line, right? And so we got to talking, and I, sp I spoke with this kid. And, you know, he said something to me was probably one of the most brilliant things. That, I mean, he couldn't have been no more than like seven or eight years old. And he told me, he says, you know, he said it's like the number, after, the, after it was over, we got an opportunity to talk to the kids. And he said it's like the number seven, because we start talking about fighting over religion. <laughs> and he says, you know, like one kid says five plus two is seven. One kid says, his parents says six plus one is seven. And one kid <laughs> says, you know, four plus three is seven. And you're fighting. Right. Right? right, and you're fighting over the same thing. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And I, and I can say it very because mo like most of us, we came through. We, we reverted. So in other words, I came. I grew up in the church, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I became and I reverted to Islam. Mm -hmm. You know, twenty something years ago, and so for me, I really know the similarities. I know how ridiculous the arguments and the and the 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 arguments about who's right, who's wrong. They teach you this. They teach you that. Regardless of who's saying it is that in the final analysis, you know, everybody wants the same thing. Mm -hmm. And it's all the, and it's the same God. There's not three different guys. There's only one God. Right. You know what I mean? And the thing about it, regardless of what I think about an individual, and regardless of what that individual thinks about me, if we're really here to serve our creator, we're going to get along, mm -hmm. regardless. Because yeah. our, 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 the doctrines of what our creator teaches us is going to make that happen if we're following his path you know what i mean we're not going to mistreat anyone mm -hmm. we're going to try to you know and you're not going to proselytize someone by doing something bad you know because god does not god is not hate you know what i mean god is always love mm -hmm. always love you know and so what happens is is that when we're fighting with each other, with each other over things that are just you know so trivial we're fighting you know it's the devil mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It, the, you know, it's just an opportunity for the devil to get involved and to allow us to do crazy things and mistreat. I'm not mistreating anybody mm -hmm. because, you know, my God does not allow that to happen. Mm -hmm. Your God does not allow that to happen. Your God doesn't allow that to happen. We're going to get along. I mean, you know, it, 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 it absolutely makes any sense. So once we bridge that gap and realize that there's nothing for us to, to fight about, then we should work from an interfaith perspective to reach out in the community and bring people, embrace people, and show people love. Yes. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So instead of just showing people hate, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? I mean, how are you going to say, you know, um, you know, I love my creator and I'm following my creator, and I'm hating you because you don't, maybe, uh, you know, you're a Christian, or I'm going to hate you because I think you, you know, you know, you're a Muslim because I'm believing these things that people are saying. Mm -hmm. You know, and even if they're saying, even if, it, if there could be even truth to it, I'm still going to love you anyway, mm -hmm. because my God tells me to love you. You see what I mean? So, mm -hmm. you know, and that's what we need to teach people. That's why there's so, that's why there's so much violence in in our society, because it's not something that necessarily manifests itself in the streets. It manifests itself from our leaders. You know, our leaders are violent. That's the way they deal with everything. Mm -hmm. You know, the same way that gangs deal with each other is the same way our government deals yes. with people from yes. time to time. You know what I mean? Because you just can't fight everybody. You know, there has to be love, and you're fighting over things that are that are superficial, mm -hmm. and it, it makes absolutely no sense, Correct. you know. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as far as what do you think that we can do to actually start reaching out to other institutions or other pastors and other imams to begin to start number one bridging the gap with each other but going out in the community and, and and kind of you know making sure that we're looking not only for those within the criminal justice system but those who need us yeah. I, I think <clears throat> probably what we should do what I try to do is form alliances with people that think like me mm -hmm. or I think like them mm -hmm. I can I can know when I'm in the presence of my twin spirit, mm -hmm. spiritually speaking, right. uh, and build this edifice brick, brick by brick. We're not going to get everybody to uh, join in and respond to what needs to be done. I mean, we have to be wise enough to know that it, it, this is nothing but the devil that divides us. Mm. Uh, for example, in communist, I won't mention the country, but in one particular country when communism was on the rise, and it was trying to get its legs firm underneath it, 
uh, it appealed to the people and said, look, what are these Christians doing for you? Uh, how, how have your life changed? And what are the Muslims doing for you? You know, religion is the opium of the people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Try a little bit of this, communism. Let's see how you like that. So the people bought into it. They woke up the next day and found that their bank accounts had been seized. <laughs> <laughs> so so the, the enemy is not the Muslim, it's not the Christian, it's not the black, the white, mm -hmm. it's not your wife, it's not your husband. The enemy, our enemies are lies, mm -hmm. innuendo, distrust, suspicion, hatred, misinformation. You turn the TV on these days, you see the, the spirit and the language you see coming from Christians mm -hmm. is nothing but pure hatred. How can you say you love God, but you hate people? Mm -hmm. It's impossible to love God and hate people. That, that, those dynamics don't, they don't merge. Uh, you have to first love people. That proves your love for God. Mm -hmm. You see Muslims not following, the, not following the spirit nor the letter, the tradition of the Quran, spewing out nothing but hatred killing their own people, killing innocent people. This is, this is the, what we're seeing in the world today. So there has to be someone that's willing to extend a hand and say, hey, you know, brother, let's go and walk together and let's, uh, let's tackle this problem. Mm -hmm. And together, united, we can have an effect on this. We can, we can make changes because through faith, you can do anything, you know. Mm -hmm. Christ Jesus was the one to say, your faith has saved you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think it's going to have to happen like, like what we're doing right now. Mm -hmm. You know, you extend an invitation to me, and naturally I'll come and do mm -hmm. whatever I can. Mm -hmm. And I think that's how, it, how, we, how we do yeah. it. Right. And we build it up. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, you know, whether you're Muslim, whether you're atheist, whether you're Christian, you know, Buddhist, Hindu, it, it doesn't matter what... what you identify yourself with love knows mm -hmm. no boundaries. He mm -hmm. doesn't love is not prejudice. Love is, is it's something we all look for. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, when a young boy or girls in, 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 in uh, high school, junior high school, you know, even early elementary, they like a, they like a boy, they like a girl. They're attracted to someone love knows no boundaries. It doesn't, it, you know, it, it's, it's not prejudice. Mm -hmm. And I think if we start that at love, because we can all look at each other and see the difference in each other. Mm -hmm. But if we're looking to see what we have in common with each other, mm -hmm. and that's love, right. is, is we, can, we can do more with that and start at, let that be the foundation, let that be the starting point. Mm -hmm. And then we can walk together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, instead of looking at what's different, well, I don't like this about you and I don't like that about you, but well, we can come back to the place of love mm -hmm. and say, hey, this is what I love about you. Well, this is, you know, right. I love it because you are that you were made in the image of God. Mm -hmm. You know, you were you you were God's, uh, you made in His likeness in His image. Let's start there. Right. You know, because we are we are all at that starting point, mm -hmm. and then we can hold hands together. And we can walk forward and, and accomplish more. And like I was talking about accomplishing more together, because love has to be the f the, the, the foundation of that. Mm -hmm. And and if not, it, you know, it, it's it's going to get misguided. It's right. misguided if it's not starting at that point. Yeah, you know. Yeah, most definitely. I mean, it. yeah, I, you know, I, you know, when it comes to recidivism and faith and stuff like that, I can kind of directly relate to that. You know, considering the fact that, you know, back in like 1983, I started going in and out of juvenile hall. I think from 1983 to 1986 was a three-year span. From the time I got out from doing nine months of juvenile camp, I was back in within a couple of months, mm -hmm. uh, up until like 1986. Um, when I actually um, received a life sentence. And from 1986 to, uh, to 1994, I encountered uh, Imam Ron Alamine in 1994. I became one of his students. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, he put so much trust in me when he would leave and, and not be present, I was to act in his capacity at that particular time in Chino State Prison. And it's been years, and then it is 24 years later, I'm sitting here at the table with him. And that just shows you, that speaks volumes in terms of what faith can actually do. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't go back to jail. I didn't, you know, repeat, you know, from that point on. He was my second teacher in Islam. Mm -hmm. And I think that now when I look at, 
you know, the impact that religion have and faith have on individuals. You know, we tackle it inside, you know, you know, that's once a person has made the mistake and been there. Mm -hmm. But I think it's it's more critical for us to, you know, be on the outside of these walls and tackling the issue on the outside of this wall so they don't have to go to prison. Mm -hmm. You know, like you say, um, you can remember back in the days of, you know, the Nation of Islam when something happened in the community. They was on the forefront. Mm -hmm. They was out there. You know, you've seen the movies about it. You know, you hear the talk about it. And those who actually lived in there, like the doc over here, you know, lived through those eras, you know, and seen those, those things. And I think that whenever we have those critical issues that confront our community, whether it's black on black crime, brown on brown crime, police brutality, whatever it is, we don't see, we don't see, the church. We don't see people from the mass yet out there on the forefront. Mm -hmm. This is what That's we right. need to see. Mm -hmm. These are the institutions that we need to see out there on the forefront in order for it to be, to, for, for people to actually to hear this call mm -hmm. that we are trying. Saying oppression is oppression no matter where it's at in the world, mm -hmm. oppression is oppression. Mm -hmm. And as religious people, as people of faith, that if we can sit by and just allow this to happen, what that says about our faith. Mm -hmm what that says about us as individuals. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you you and, you know, you know expressed about, you know, what the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said about, you know, you know change it with your, your hand or change it with your mouth. But when he said you don't speak out against it, it is the weakest of faith. The weakest of faith. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, and who wants to sit on the weakest of faith? Mm -hmm. I surely don't. And so this opportunity for us to speak right here, to open up this dialogue, mm -hmm. I think it opens it up to the people who are listening, saying that we need to, so when the next time that the next police brutality happen, we'll see our religious you know, institutions out there on the forefront mm -hmm. of the line. Right. That's absolutely right. Yes, sir. Yeah. Well, um, I think the conversation has been outstanding. I'm, I'm gonna go a little deeper and I'm gonna go into another direction. You know, at the end of the day, wants show up in conversation, but expectations show up in behavior. And I think what has to happen, we've got to look at the rationale on why our religious institutions have not been effective uh, or as effective as they can. When you look worldwide and understand predominantly the worldwide cultures are driven by religious norms, religious practices, and yet we see the diametric uh, uh, confrontations that we see worldwide, something is wrong with that input. Usually there's three fundamentals when we're talking about the lack of what a church or a religion institution engages when we're talking about criminal justice, et cetera. First, so many of these religious institutions are just that, they're institutions. The body of religion is just that. It's supposed to be a body of individuals who come together to propagate a given wisdom, a way of ideology, et cetera. We have allowed our institutions, our, our religious institutions to be just that, institutions which allow them to become part of the status quo. And this is the status quo that many of these religious institutions have created. Number two, the religious institutions has been so eloquently said by both uh, Bilal and uh, both our two uh, guests, is that they're out of touch with the people. They're not, what's driving what they do, their rationale at the end of the day is what they hear, not what they see, mm -hmm. is what they envision, but not what they touch. And if you don't know the normality of the people that you're dealing with, if you're not truly there to serve and to serve, you must understand. To understand, you must engage. I've heard love talked about today numerous times, but very few of us give unconditional love. Because see, I have to value you, I have to respect and honor you, and I have to appreciate you to love you. And we're not doing that. We don't see that type of love worldwide, uh, but yet we see the religious institutions forming and just taking uh, total control of the dynamics geographically and regionally, et cetera. And then third, um, uh, most religious, uh, and I hate to call them institutions, but that what, 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 that's what they are. They don't understand the ability to deal with the element of, cri uh, of criminal justice, justice, et cetera. When you stop and think most of the prophets, peace be alone, uh, upon them all, uh, were or came into fruition under unjust environments, under unjust uh, normalities, under unjust individuals who did not like the concepts that they were bringing, mm -hmm. and most of your prophets of Islam were condemned. We looked at most religions were born out of injustice, and yet here we are today as religious institutions uh, afraid to go in and balance the unjust circumstances that are predominantly controlling the dynamics of the world. 
when you don't have the backbone, when you don't have the tenacity, when you don't have uh, that courage to step up and balance the wrongs, and that's really what we're talking about. We're talking about inclusion. We're talking about people having the ability to feel their worth, their value, their greatness. And we're talking about creating equitable services locally, uh, regionally, and internationally that allow people to value what they're supposed to bring to the table. Then we don't have real religious institutions leading anything. And we need to do a serious inflection. We need to look at the dynamic of the infrastructure that these, these entities are operating from and asking the question, are we truly meeting the needs of the people? When you look at the amount of poverty, when you look at the amount of person-to-person of -person destruction, when you look at the amount of wars, when you look at the amount of just the lack of value of each other, something is wrong with the dynamics of the input that is going in that has to be changed. We will have brothers like these and individuals that will stand up and step up, but that can't be a, uh, uh, it, it can't be a, uh, just an individuality. We've got to change the normality of how our institutions are operating. And I'll lastly say this, I think this is one of the biggest problems. We, the people, are allowing these institutions to define our realities uh, through practices, through principles, principles through formalities, but not through the essence of the religion. And until we question those entities, until we make them redefine what their thinking process and what their methodologies are that are going to meet our needs, then we're going to be in this uh, dynamic uh, ongoingly and possibly indefinitely until we get the courage to say, no more, the dynamic has to change. Yeah. Right. If, if, I, if I may, if, excellent, if, if I may, may just brother. add one little sure. piece. You are so right. Uh, religious, the religious leadership has to step up and redefine what is man, what is woman, uh -huh. what is life, what is the role of man, who are we, where we come from, why are we here, where. These things have been defined, again, I'll say, by Hollywood. <coughs> corporate America, yes. etc. We have to reassume that role and redefine these things according to and put them in the context in which God has placed them. And until we do that, we're going to still continue to have these young people coming up thinking that to be a man, you have to look a certain way, mm -hmm. this way, the way the media tells me to look, or I have to behave a certain way. And, and that's a serious problem. Mm -hmm. That's a serious problem. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, they're very much, the, the media is very much involved. They, they create the narrative, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and basically, and, and we kind of follow suit with allowing them to create the narrative as to how we address it, what the, even the issue sometimes. Mm -hmm. They create the narrative with regards to the issues that we actually, you know, address. And, you know, when you, and now, of course, more than ever, and we talked about this almost every week, especially with our younger people, I mean, news and media is instant. It's, it's mm -hmm. in your ear immediately with our kids, with the, the social media and with the cell phones. I mean, it's, 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 it's so much in their ears nowadays that we're competing against it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? When we're talking mm -hmm. about our parents and our churches, and our institutions, whether you're talking about the masjid or whatever, we're competing with our ki children with this social media and all the stuff mm -hmm. you're talking about, mm -hmm. Imam, that yeah. these people are having access to. You know, it, it, it's difficult. You know, and I always say when I was a kid, once I went home, that was it. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't have no cell phones or, or you know, Facebook or email. Mm -hmm. I didn't have any of that. My, my, all I had was my, my right, parents, right, right. you know, and my, you know. <laughs> But nowadays, I mean, it doesn't stop, yeah. you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, you got little kids in the bed at night on their cell phones, mm -hmm. you know, looking up things. And it's so much junk that's going in their head. And, and, and our institutions, it's more important now than ever that our, our religious leaders are out there on the ground trying to touch these people before they go on the right path. I mean, we have mm -hmm. to do that. Um, and, and again, I mean, I'm not, I'm not here to proselytize one thing or another. But I mean, you know, it is what it is. I mean, we, we, you know, nowadays, you know, it's not politically correct to talk about religion. It's not politically mm -hmm. correct to talk about God. You know, they make it a bad thing now, mm -hmm. you know, to even have the conversation. Right. But, you know, it saved 
you know, I can tell you it saved my life. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And and not and you know, it saved many people I know, it saved their life. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? I know a lot of people who may have more money than I have, they may have be in a better position than I have, you know, but they don't have the 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 religious foundation and they're lost. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I know people who got millions and millions and millions of dollars that you know, they're a day away from killing themselves because yeah. mm -hmm. they don't know what life, life is really about. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? And if you don't have that foundation, and we see it with young people, they're always trying to find something. You know what I mean? They're trying to find what's going to make them happy. They go from one thing to another. If I get the job, I'm going to be happy. If I marry the right person, I'm going to be happy. If I got the right bunny, I'm going to be happy. If I got the right house, it, it never stops mm -hmm. when you don't know really what life is all about because if you don't have you know, faith and you don't have your creator, it don't mean anything right. in a final analysis. You know what I mean? Because, you know, yeah. like like they say in the military, I've never seen an atheist in a foxhole. When, you, when you're on that last breath, <coughs> you know what I mean? Who, yeah. who are you thinking about? Yeah. You know, you you know, know I, think it's, I think it's important, you know, for, I know for me is, is understanding that um, people are going to make mistakes. You know, we're, 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 we're going to make mistakes. But it's when they make that mistake that... What I've learned is is I can't change nobody. Mm -hmm. You know, I can't change I can't take the responsibility and try to change somebody because I can't. Mm -hmm. What I can do though is position them to encounter God. Mm -hmm. To position them to encounter to counter to encounter Jesus so that when that happens, they will begin to make a change. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's one thing that I do when I encounter people in the streets. I, I'm not trying to change them. I'm trying to in position them to encounter so that they can be encountered by the love of God. Mm -hmm. And that will change a man, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. for growing up, you know, especially, you know, um, without fathers. We have many, many children growing up without fathers, and, and I believe it starts there. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we have something inside of us that we want to be loved by our fathers. Mm -hmm. And when that cool. doesn't happen, mm -hmm. we grow up misguided, not understanding what love is about. Mm -hmm. We relate to God by, by, by how our father has treated us. Mm -hmm. If we didn't grow up with it. We, we, we're, we, we don't have the understanding of a father's love. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I think that we can come back to the basics. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't teach if you haven't been taught. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think if we start instilling um, that understanding to, 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 to men, teenagers, you know, a, adult males, to get back to their children, mm -hmm. to come back and, and to begin to love them. It's right. never too late. Right. It's not too late yeah. to come back and start to loving their children again. Oh, yeah. You know, and, and, and start showing them start helping them mm -hmm. um you know but uh, going back to what i was saying is is I've, I've i've understood that hey i can't i'm not i can't change anybody i'm not position to change people right. or you know to, I, what i'm doing is i'm and i'm introducing them to jesus to god so that they can make that change that they need mm -hmm. you know and i'm just here to help them along the way because people are going to make mistakes and what happens um especially in, in the in the ghettos and in, in, in the vaudeos all across the nation they're very passionate people mm -hmm. You know, in prison, you've seen a bunch of people that were very passionate about what they about what they were doing. Mm -hmm. You know, you would walk the prison yard and you would talk, hear guys talk about their war stories of what ha happened in, in, you know, in, when they were out in the street. They were very passionate about it. If we can turn that passion around mm -hmm. to, that, to, that, there, to that, there's no going back. Right. Mm -hmm. See, you know, one of the things, though, from the street perspective, and I'm talking about hardcore street. Uh, some of us have been there. I know you have. Uh, these brothers and sisters have become so marginalized that their reasons to drive and the reason to stay alive is not draw, strong enough. And if that religion is not giving us and reinforcing the reason to live, the reason to, to assume the essence of my divinity in life, I'm not going to gravitate towards that religion mm -hmm. because so many other things have failed me, mm -hmm. especially in marginalized communities where nothing is there for the individual. So we can't, at the end of the day, just drop a religion and say, follow mm -hmm. this and right. you'll be loved, accepted, etc. If you don't give me the rationale of the reason to meet my needs, if I don't have that essence and that driver is not coming out of me, viva that religion, I am not going to stay with that religion. I am not going to embrace that religion. Matter of fact, I'm going to run away from that religion because I'm going to feel that religion is going to punk me at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. So we've got to, we've really got to understand that dynamic, mm -hmm. especially on the streets today. 
because yeah. we've got we've got brothers all over being taught religion, and yet a week, a month, or two later, they're more destructive back. than they are yeah. before. So we we just got to understand that. Uh, I agree with what you're saying, but we got to understand the whole complex, the whole holistic uh, nature of really what's going on out well, there. Well, I, I I think it goes back to we're we're, we're selling them a. a, a a false bag of goods, so to speak, because we come at him, we tell him, hey, go to church, serve God, and your life's going to be great. That's right. And when and when push comes to serve, sometimes their their life gets worse. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they're like, hey, wait a minute, I thought this yes. thing was supposed to help me, yes. and it's made my life worse, yes. you know? Yes. And and what yes. happens is, you know, there, there's a portion of scripture that when that when Jesus was born, uh, uh, in scripture tells us that, 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 that they started killing all, all the all the newborn babies from two years two years and younger because they, they were trying to find out who it was. And I think that the, the, the devil tries to kill us in our infancy. In the beginning of your dreams, in the beginning of your walk with God, he tries to take you out in your infancy because you're defenseless. Mm -hmm. And he says, Look, I'm gonna attack you at this time because you're defenseless. Mm -hmm. And I think if we can understand and come behind them and reinforce that, hey, we're gonna be here with you. We're not gonna leave you. Mm -hmm. And that's the whole thing. When 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 little boys are growing up in the streets, you know, and 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 there's, and 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 they're and they're facing, a, they're, they're they get jumped in the gang because they feel they're by themselves. Mm -hmm. Hey, I need a gang to back me up. Mm -hmm. I can't get this by themselves, and the gang will be will be there for them. The gang will will re. I mean, I know that, the, the gang will back you up. They'll mm -hmm. go, they'll die for you. Yes. And in the same sense, mm -hmm. will your brothers will your brothers in Christ do that for you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know. You know. This is a subject matter, of course, that can go on and on and on. <laughs> and you know. The, the thing about it is I, I remember my mother once telling me, she says, you know, son, you just have to pray. You, you know, you, you guys got to pray about it. You got to pray about it. And, you know, and I used to sit back and I used to think about it. And I said, okay, yeah, I pray about it, right? But well, then I remember reading the scripture said that, that, that faith without works, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. you know, is, yes. is nothing, you know? So yes. where is the works? And the works is the application. You got to go out there and you have That's to right. put work in, in in the streets. I remember, look, when I first accepted Islam and, and, and they said that, okay, uh, you're not allowed to turn the other cheek. You know, I come from the hood. You know, I came from the deep part of the hood, you know. I didn't want to be no punk about nothing, you know. You know, let alone, you know, once I got, you know, became a Muslim, you know, I didn't want to be a punk. So when they say I don't have to turn the other cheek, I was like, oh, yeah, I'm with this because, you, you know. So so the thing about it is even with this fight right now against oppression, that fight is still there. And I think for the people, that fight has to be there. Those works have to be there. Don't just sit at the house and just think you're going to pray and think it's going to be over with. Okay. You have to put the work in. Teach. Right. Yeah, Teach. most definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and most certainly, you know. Um, <laughs> uh, we do not, We do, like you said, we do not have the power to change, but we have the power to influence because God has called us to be different. Yeah. And I feel like it's so important for, you know, all of us uh, and all of you to be sitting here and be talking about issues that are important in our communities and to you know make do action to be active and actually inform people that we have to take action the time is now in such you know crucial times and 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 how our culture is nowadays that we have kim kardashian in the news you know going to the white house and lobbying the president on trying to pardon someone from from prison so it's a different culture it's totally different but you know it, it still stands we, we are called to be different to be um change makers so um you know i encourage every, all of those of you listening to um in the radio to you know tune in Every um, every Sunday, and to call 909-792-5222 if you ever want to be involved in in the talk, and also to log into our Gmail, send us emails if you have any comments, concerns. Um, JusticeWatchRadio at gmail .com. Back to you, Mr. Ali. <laughs> All right, thank you. All right, again, man, I, I really enjoy this topic, man. I really hope that we can continue and do a series on on this topic because I think it's really, really important. And I really appreciate both you, Imam Alamein, for coming in, man. I am blessed that you, you know, with your presence as well as you, Pastor Frank, for coming in. And hopefully you guys will come back again Definitely. and bless us with your presence. Um, on behalf of myself, Zulu, Attorney Zulu Ali and the Justice Rock Watch crew, Michael Clark, Rosa Nunez, and Dr. Akil Bashir. Uh, we'll see you next week, the same time, same place, same channel.